Right, we do still have a few more people joining, but in the meantime, it's 11 a.m., uh, so let's make a start. So welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is the second in Epigeum's Thought Leadership Series. We're going to be discussing uh, student mental health, the problems that students and universities are currently facing, and what we can all do to show support. So my name is Marianne, and I work within marketing at Epigeum. I'll be facilitating today's webinar alongside my colleague, Katie. Epigeum, which is part of Sage Publishing, is a leading provider of online training courses supporting the needs of higher education institutions in three core areas, research, support and wellbeing, and study. So today we'll be sharing and discussing ideas surrounding support and wellbeing, specifically regarding student mental health within institutions. I'm very pleased to welcome our prestigious speakers, Lily Margaroli and Dr. Dominique Thompson. Our first guest, Lily, is the former Students Guild President and Nightline Co-President at the University of Exeter and has a wealth of hands-on experience of student wellbeing from their leadership roles. Our second guest, Dom, is a multi-award winning general practitioner, young person's mental health expert, author and educator with two decades of clinical experience. So on behalf of Epigeum and everyone who's joined this webinar, I'm thrilled to have both of you here with us today from such well-versed backgrounds and to hear your presentations on what is a crucial topic for us all to educate ourselves on. We have a Q&A box below, so please do write in any questions throughout for our speakers, and we'll try to answer these towards the later part of our session. The second thing to note is this webinar is being recorded today, and we will share the recording and the slides uh, shortly after the event. So now that that's all complete, I would like to pass over to our first speaker, Lily. Uh, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Marianne. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to everyone today about what is a, an incredibly important topic. And as you're here, I'm sure um, you already know that. So I'm going to you know, try and focus on um, the challenges that both students and universities are facing um, and also some actionable steps, steps that hopefully sort of wherever you are in a university, um, you can you can utilize some of this information to support you in your role. Marianne gave a very kind introduction who I was, but I'll just say a little bit more about sort of my experience and, and hopefully why um, that makes me kind of a good person to listen to um, in this instance. So I did my undergraduate degree um, at Exeter University. I studied PPE there. And during that time, I was um, a listening volunteer and co-president of the Student Nightline. Um, for anyone that doesn't know what the Student Nightline is, it's very similar to Samaritans, but it's a student on student sort of support service where students can call um, text or anything like that um, sort of during the closed hours of the university to, to get support, to chat to someone if they're lonely, anything like that. Um, and I did that uh, during COVID, which was a um, very interesting period and gave a really interesting insight into uh, what was going on for lots of students during that time. After I graduated, um, I was president of the Students Guild for two years. I was very lucky to have that experience. It was fantastic to work with students on the ground um, and also sort of senior university leadership. And during this role, one of the projects that I worked on was a sort of major external review of the support services um, at the University of Exeter, which was, again, a fantastic insight. Now I work with um, the behavioural insights team on education, sort of bringing behavioural science into education. And there's a little bit um, of my presentation today, which which brings in some behavioural insights. Um, but I'll go on to now the, the challenges impacting students. So next slide, please. Um, I see there being three sort of core challenges that we um, as institutions, but also as students are facing during the moment in, with regards to student mental health. So firstly, it's sort of lack of basic provision. I think there is, um, for, for a lot of students, um, accessing wellbeing support is something which is caused by a lack of what they need in their lives to sort of thrive. So that might be stress around sort of food, um, stress around how they're going to pay for bills or stress around um, how they might be paying for transport to and from university. And our students are less resourced than ever. And that's due to things like the cost of living crisis, but also due to maintenance loads sort of falling in real terms and not catching up with the sort of high costs which students are facing at the moment and that puts a real stress on um, students mental health 
Secondly, um, we have sort of increased needs and decreased resourcing. So that's obviously very related to the first point. Um, but mental health services within the NHS are over capacity. There's lots of things on the news all about um, how much stress that sort of area of the NHS is under. And areas where university support services would have previously expected or assumed that the NHS would um, sort of take control of in terms of student support, they are no longer seeing that. So universities are expected um, and doing more for student wellbeing and sort of more severe student mental health needs than they have done before. And at the same time, um, universities are facing sort of real term cuts in funding. And that's due to things like sort of the fixed um, fixed fees for universities um, and also just where we are as an economy at the moment. And what's important to say there, and of course, everyone who's on this call will know, is that um, I by, by no means am saying that universities don't want to support students. I think everyone has a real desire to do more to support students, but actually just the sort of circumstances that we're working in are, are increasingly difficult. And then finally, the diversity of students' needs um, are growing. So the diversity of our student population is growing, which is fantastic. We all want to have diverse um, students within our institutions, whether that's what country they're from, what their first language is, um, their background, um, and anything like that. That's fantastic. And we also, something that I don't think is spoken about as much, is we also have a growing diversity of sort of the modes of learning which students are um, having. So we have more students that are off campus, that are hybrid learners, um, that are doing more technical degrees and those can cause students to have all different sorts of problems which the traditional sort of undergraduate student who's at university for three years and living on campus wouldn't have faced and I think we maybe are, are struggling slightly to catch up with those sort of unique student needs. Um, so I'll go on to the next slide please. And importantly, the challenges which students and universities face are not all equal. So different student groups that I spoke about slightly there um, are more diverse student groups will face these challenges differently and will be more impacted. And we've seen that through the cost of living crisis and also through COVID. Um, students groups that are more disadvantaged generally are more adversely affected by any sort of external factors. So, for example, students who um, were commuting or are still commuting during the cost of living crisis had massive increase in costs due to things like cost of petrol and rising costs of transport. So it's important to consider how these different things like actually impact different groups that are on the ground. Next slide, please. So I wanted really to focus most of my talk on what, what we can do, what I think can be done within universities to help students and to help universities cope with the, the sort of support that students need. Um, I'm sure as you're all here, you're quite aware of what the situation is and, and what students need help. So I'll start with going over some sort of ground level support. So this is what I think that hopefully most people within institutions can see how um, easy changes can be made. So this is on things sort of like communication, making communication effective and sensitive, and ensuring that actually the support that's already available, students know about. So it's not about reinventing the wheel, it's just about making sure that people know that it's there. And then I will go on to some more high level strategies. So things which I think are um, needing a sort of whole institutional approach and I think would have massive benefits for universities to get on board with, but also appreciating that this comes with, with all sorts of challenges, um, time-wise, financially, and sort of just culture-wise. And then my final point kind of brings together that ground, ground level support um, and also high level strategy. So that's around sort of community building and resilience, but I'll get into that more in a moment. So firstly, I'll start with ground level support. So the first thing, which I think can be really easy for people to do, when I say easy, nothing's that easy. Everyone's got difficult jobs, but I think compared to some of the other things, this is slightly easier. So just looking at the way that we communicate with students during sort of sensitive times. So I'm thinking about things like academic misconduct, um, releasing exam results and any sort of uh, communication that could cause a student a level of stress. So that could be things about visas, things about students' place, things about students' accommodation. So I think it's really worthwhile to look at that communication and look at how it could be read if you were a very stressed, vulnerable student late on a Friday night when you're not going to be able to communicate with anyone at the university until next week. So firstly, I think sending out emails on a Friday or sending out emails like close to the evening time when students can't actually come into the university to get support. If you're sending out any emails at that time and you can reasonably change the time that you send them, do that. If your emails are sort of overly sort of um, focused on what the student has done wrong or how um, much trouble the student could be in, then change that because 
ultimately the student will know that they've done something wrong or that they could be in trouble. But if we can focus on, you're just going to come in for a chat, for example, around academic misconduct, you're just going to come in for a chat and we will support you through this process because the process will happen as it happens. And if they have plagiarised, then that will go forward. But we don't need to put students under undue sort of stress from that initial communication. Um, secondly, don't do work twice. So this hopefully should be a point on reducing people's workloads. So lots of faculties, lots of departments, and um, lots of people within universities are working towards supporting students with mental health um, through all different sorts of events and projects. So communicate with colleagues um, in similar roles in different departments, um, communicate with your student union about what projects are going on and try and figure out how you can sort of collaborate with them rather than sort of trying to set up something on your by yourself. So that could be something like, um, um, working with your student union who are already working to support minority student groups. So a lot of student unions will have um, already set up sort of collective groups for commuting students. Um, they might have a sort of room that they've allocated for commuting students who are coming in only for each day and your college might be really interested in how to support commuting students more so instead of doing your own sort of like survey or going out to try and help why not learn from the student union first um, before going to do that because they might be able to give you some pointers and save you some time and then thirdly it's just around increasing the knowledge of um, staff and students on what support is available so I'm sure all of you already are very clued up on the support available at your university but are all the other staff members in your team as aware could you create some sort of info sheets that you can send out for tutors to just have on their desk when they have a tutor meeting so that if a student speaks to them they can just look down and really easily find out what support is already available for students. I'll now go on to the sort of more high level strategies. I just need to check time to make sure that I'm not going over too much. Um, perfect. So high level strategies. So firstly, um, something which I think all universities are already trying to do is coordination amongst support teams. So we have so many different avenues in which students can get help. And that is fantastic. But when you're a student who is, is vulnerable and is at quite a high level of stress, it actually can be overwhelming to have all that choice and not know where to go. And I think a really important sort of ethos to have is that no door is the wrong door. Wherever students go to try and get help first, they should only be one step away from sort of the right team. If a student comes to an information desk and say that they need support, um, whether that's financially or with mental health or with any sort of other issue that they have, if that student is then passed around the university, they will not feel like they're being supported and they might not end up actually asking for help. So communication between teams, setting up sort of monthly meetings to talk about how teams can like help different students and what communication might be helpful between those teams on a daily basis is really important. And then secondly, another point which I think some universities are starting to do is sort of using um, data, using the, the information which you have on students to proactively identify students who are in need. So if a student is accessing the library at a, a much lower level than usual or their attendance is dropping um, below a point that they usually would, it might be an indication that they're under under pressure or under stress and they need some extra support and this isn't about sort of spying on students or overly monitoring what they're doing and, and sort of getting suggesting that they're in trouble because they haven't been accessing the university resources as much it's just about recognizing when there is a change and what that might signify um, and that can be a really useful way to actually use all of the sort of um online learning services and access cards and all the data that that gives us to actually support students and then finally, um, quite a huge point, but I think it's worth raising anyway and starting the conversation around uh, the tutoring system and how that supports students and how that was initially designed at a time when universities and our students' populations were vastly different and hasn't necessarily developed um, and evolved with what our universities are like now. Would students find it more helpful to have more pastoral support than an academic advisor who maybe isn't always that interested in being their advisor? Now, lots of tutors are fantastic and will put loads of time into their tutees. But I think we all know that some tutors don't think that it's their main role and some students therefore don't have the best experience with their tutor. Would it be better to have someone who has been trained and it is their role to give support to students or could there be a way of sort of merging the two roles, still having an academic tutor 
and maybe partially having a cohort sort of pastoral support advisor. There are different ways of looking at this, but I think it is worth starting the conversation around is the academic tutor um, to program, which most universities have at the moment, is that fit for purpose? Is that giving students the support that they need? Next slide, please. So this is my sort of final point, and I think it comes, um, it's important for everyone at a university, and that's including if we have any students on the call today, I think this is something which students can get involved with as well. So it's building communities and resilience. I think resilience can be a term which has quite negative connotations, but I don't, I'm not meaning it to be um, to have a sort of stiff upper lip or just kind of go to university and don't complain. Um, that's not what I mean by resilience. What I'm, what I'm meaning is students are going to face challenges in their university degree. I mean, that is part of university and ultimately that's part of life. And we want to give students the tools and the facilities to be able to face those challenges without it having a detrimental impact on them. And um, we don't like we're never going to remove every challenge that a student is going to face that's not realistic and that doesn't reflect the real world either but we want to give them the tools to face that um, in a healthy way so these are some things which i think can help build communities and therefore help build um, students resilience because they have people to go to and they feel a sense of belonging so firstly, moving away from Freshers Week and moving more into a welcome term approach. So that first week or first sort of two weeks of university is a very, very stressful um, period for students. For a lot of students, they find it very fun. But for a lot of students, especially if it's your first time in the country, it's your first time in an English speaking country, first time away from home, maybe you're neurodivergent all of these other things, a week just seems like a, a very stressful period of time to try and figure out the whole university thing. And then it's term one and like then it's week one of teaching and suddenly you're expected to know everything. So moving from Freshers' Week to a welcome term would basically just mean spreading out all of those events, spreading out all of those activities that you do in one week over the whole term. Um, so that could be doing more induction walks around campus throughout the first half of term, um, holding more sort of cohort building activities within your department throughout the first, um, the first term rather than just in that first week. And secondly, a point that which I sort of touched on a bit earlier, um, which is like the relationship between communities and resilience. If you have a cohort community as a student, you will have people who you can speak to when you come up with academic um, challenges. So you will know people in your cohort. So if you're a law student, you'll have friends who are law students. It's not about sort of isolating students just into their course, but it's about making sure that students do feel part of a cohort and feel like they have a sense of belonging within that cohort. And finally, one point which can be really helpful to, um, to help build communities is to have a relationship between the faculty or department and students. And that could be a relationship with student leaders. Um, so maybe that's department reps or people who are involved with the academic society. But if you don't already have that relationship and have sort of regular meetings with those students, then it might be something to, um, to think about doing maybe once a term, maybe more regular. Um, but just starting that relationship because you'll get to know what students, what challenges students are facing, what you can do to help and also work together to collaborate to actually solve problems rather than working in individual silos. Um, so now I'll just move on to key takeaways, I think is my next slide. So these are just three uh, points which if you've taken nothing away from the talk, which is absolutely fine, hopefully I can land these points in your mind. Um, so the first one, look at the way that you communicate with students. If it's a, it might be a simple change of a few words, putting wellbeing support into an email, looking at when you send an email. If you can do that, then you will be helping students. And think about how people in your team know about student support. If you know that there's a new member of your team who doesn't understand the support services of your university and they're speaking to students every day then have a chat to them about how they can learn more secondly build the concept of welcome term into your plans even if you don't have an institutional or sort of faculty approach to a welcome term everyone still wants to do freshers week fine is there anything that you can do in your individual team which just spreads out those activities across term one and then finally keep talking all of us probably have the answers to solve um, a lot of issues that students face, but we need to talk to each other to find them. So that's about senior staff talking to um, staff members who are on the front line, talking to students every day and everyone talking to students to find out what they're facing and what they might think is a good way of solving it. Because ultimately, if we work together, I think we can all really help students with their mental health. Um, that is all from me. I hope I haven't gone too much over or under time. Um, I'll be very uh, happy to answer any questions after Dom has spoken. Um, and if you feel, if you want to contact me, feel free to do so. But I think now I will pass over to Dom. Thank you very much, everyone, very much for listening.
Thank you. Just before um, we pass over to Dom, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Lily. I'm sure people have taken lots from that and just what a great oversight into the varied and diverse challenges different groups of students and indeed universities are facing and just also the actual steps we can take at all levels from the ground up, uh, like to high level strategies. So really, really fascinating to hear that perspective. Um, if anyone's got any questions for Lily, please do continue to use the Q&A function below. I think we've had a few come in already and yes, we'll circle back to these in a bit. Um, so without further ado, I'd like now to move on to our second speaker, Dr. Dominique Thompson. So over to you, Dom. Thank you. Wow, that was brilliant, Lily. Thank you so much. Um, quite the act to follow now, but I'll do my best. OK, so let's uh, move on the slide. And uh, so just for those of you who maybe haven't come across my work before, just to sort of set the scene, I was a GP for many, many years sitting in that chair at the University of Bristol, seeing students day in, day out. We're, we're a student specialist practice. And uh, I reckon that I probably did 78,000 consultations. So I called my TEDx talk one of them. Uh, what I learned from 78,000 consultations with university students. So if you're interested, that's 10 minutes of your life you will enjoy, hopefully. <laughs> it's set in a church. What could be, what could be more fascinating? Um, I've also written a series of books uh, called the Student Wellbeing Series, um, which sort of tried to address some of the regular issues that I was seeing in my consulting room and a book for parents and teachers with my colleague Fabienne Vales. We wanted to sort of help the teenagers before they get to university. So How to Grow a Grown Up came about and also probably one of my most favourite projects ever, I have to be careful what I say, but uh, is the one I did with Ardman Animation um, called What's Up With Everyone.com. So if you haven't had a look at that, it's lovely. It's free, obviously. It's online and it's called What's Up With Everyone.com. So um, that's my background, basically. Previously a GP, now working in anything and everything to do with young people's mental health. So next slide. So I was asked to have a think about what are the big topics. And I thought, well, it's always important to get um, some sense of context of where we are now. And the latest figures, this is NHS Digital, this sort of very latest uh, release that you'll have probably seen reported in the press is that about one in five children and young people between eight and 25 has a probable mental disorder. What does that mean? Well, they surveyed people, um, young people using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, if you're interested. And I think it's particularly fascinating, obviously, because of who we are and what we do with our day to day lives, that the highest proportion were in the 17 to 19 year olds. And that in general, it was about equal between males and females until you got to the 17 to 25 year olds, where it was young women who were struggling more than young men. And we do we do see that reflected, I think, in who comes through the door when we're looking after people at university. So um, it's helpful to sort of understand uh, and the fact that that is um, an increasing number compared with previous uh, surveys. So next slide. So when I was asked uh, quite recently um, by Student Minds who are currently gathering views uh, for their manifesto around if there's a general election, you know, what are the key issues to talk about? Um, it's always helpful to just reflect and say, at the beginning, you cannot do anything till we address the basics. It is horrifying that I have to say this, but we have students who don't have safe places to live food to eat, money to buy their prescriptions or period products, as I'll come to in a bit. We cannot be dealing um, and addressing and trying to treat mental health until we, as a society, of course, address these absolute basics. And these are urgently in need of addressing. Um, sadly, they're not all in our <laughs> ability to address, uh, but it's important to recognise that before I sort of go on to the things that I'm going to talk about next. So I'm going to talk about three big topics in a second, but I'm fully recognising that we have to address these issues and that that is very difficult for us as university staff. So uh, next slide. So when we look at what students are searching 
on? What is it that they're looking up? And um, this is a really interesting uh, bit of feedback from Student Space. Some of you will have seen Student Space. If you haven't, it's a brilliant website created by Student Minds to provide sort of bite-sized bits of um, you know support, so blogs and information for students. And they looked in September, at the beginning of the academic year, what are the topics that students are looking up? You know, what are the top 10 ones that they click on? And it's fascinating to me um, to see that they're looking up money, friendship, anxiety. And it comes up again and again, all the way down that list, money, friendship, anxiety. Those are the big topics that students are looking for advice around before and as they start university. So next slide. So I've decided that if I'm going to talk about three, just three things that I can talk about, I've picked three that are, um, I think, areas where we can make a difference, where we have got some sense of um, uh, control or ability to do something, because it can be so frustrating when we're working with our students and they're struggling and suffering and we feel powerless to change some of the things that they're dealing with. So I'm going to talk about the making friends bit, the human connections bit. I'm going to talk about physical health because I am fundamentally a GP and we probably don't talk about it enough um, and touch briefly on the NHS challenges there. And I'm going to talk about a bit like Lily did, compassionate communication. So let's move on. So when we ask students, what are you most excited about? What is it that you're looking forward to? What is going to be brilliant about university? These are the things they come up. They talk about making friends and then choosing their own pathway and academic path and so on. When we ask them, moving on to the next slide, what you're most worried about, it's making friends. And then things like academic pressure, fear of failure. They don't want to let people down. It's absolutely fascinating that making friends is such a big issue. It's very much driven by that, I guess, biological drive, evolutionary drive to find your tribe at university. And I use that term because it comes from when we evolved and we all lived uh, in caves together as families and the younger ones would grow up and have to leave the cave and move off to create their new tribe. Well, that basic biological drive is very much why our teens, for example, think their friends are more important than their family. They don't actually, but that is how it sometimes feels. If you're a parent of a teenager, you'll know what I mean. Um, but it is all about finding those new people and it can be really stressful. So let's move on to the next slide. It has become increasingly difficult and stressful, I think, for the youngest generation coming into university at the moment because they basically had two years of their normal social development time disrupted at an absolutely crucial time when they would normally be learning how to interact with all sorts of other different humans, how to have good conversations, how to meet people, how to build your conversational skills. They have missed out on those for obvious reasons. I don't need to explain again. And unfortunately, it has led to problems with loneliness going up, feeling isolated. Um, we are hearing more from our accommodation colleagues saying, um, you know, that the first years are struggling all the time. Uh, there are a lot of tears. They're not getting on very well. I also hear it when I go into schools and I'm talking to the teachers who um, support, you know, the secondary school age pupils and the sixth formers saying, you know, our year eights are falling out all the time. They're fighting all the time and much worse than it was before. And so one of the things that perhaps if we recognize this is not to just assume, well, they'll get the hang of it. They never learned how to do it. Um, those of us who are a bit older went through COVID, missed out two years a bit of seeing our friends and family. But when we went back to normal, not quite, you know, but back to normal, we slipped back into our old habits. We had something to fall back to. But we have a generation coming through that have never learned some of those social skills. So one of the things that when I've talked to the teachers about, and I wonder if it's something that we could try 
in our university environments as well is the helping to build those basic social skills, taking 10 minutes, if that five minutes at the beginning of a lecture, a seminar, group work, um, to get people to talk to each other, do a sort of, you know, practice conversations. Um, if some of them are absolutely fine with it, brilliant, but give them a topic like, if you could, you know, have your own podcast, what would it be about? Or if you were a character in a book, who would you be? And just get people building their conversational skills in what is effectively a sort of safe environment for, you know, five, 10 minutes. Um, and doing it regularly means that when they do move up through their transitions into year abroad, industry years, going out into the workplace, they're not as intimidated by that whole concept of eye contact and conversational skills as they might otherwise have been. So I'm just putting it out there. I have actually written a blog on this. All my blogs are free and on my growingagrownup.com website if you're interested. So maybe have a think about if there's anything you guys can also do in that area. Okay, moving on. So physical health, physical health and mental health are obviously completely intertwined. But perhaps uh, we talk a lot now, which is brilliant, about student mental health. But what we maybe don't think about you know, quite so much, we sort of assume they know, you know, get some exercise, eat healthily. But actually, are they doing it? And um, where are the gaps? And, and it's absolutely fascinating when we start to think about it, because clearly the physical health impacts and intertwines with the mental health. So perhaps we do need to address some of these specific physical health challenges. So I've picked four, um, which are really, to me, they're fascinating and you know, slightly depressing that we <laughs> We have to, you know, um, still be thinking about this stuff. As I put at the bottom there, so much of it is driven by those financial hardships. It's just appalling, but let's address them. So let's start with the period poverty and menstrual health side of things. We know that uh, studies have shown us that 36% of UK girls aged 14 to 21 have struggled to afford or access period products during COVID. And when we look at the details, it's awful, but many of them, in fact, three quarters of them were having to use things like toilet paper because they couldn't afford proper products. And those that could afford the proper products, they were cutting back on other things like food to be able to do that. And the knock on effects of not being able to um, get the proper products and so on is that they don't go to lectures. They don't leave the house. It affects their social interactions, of course, and of course, their mental health. So that is one area that we need to think about. Moving on to dental health. As I've taken to saying recently, some of you may have seen my blog about this one, dental health equals mental health. It matters. And I'm not a dentist, but we can see from the studies that about, well, less than half of children attended a dental appointment in the last year. But we also know that when we asked students aged 18 to 24, half of them didn't think it was necessary to go to the dentist. So we have an issue here with education around dental health. And you might be saying, what's that got to do with mental health? Well, there is a vicious cycle between if you have poor dentition, poor oral health, it's going to have an impact on your anxiety, on your, it's going to make you feel more depressed, uh, maybe your social skills and so on. But also, if you have poor mental health, you are less likely to look after your teeth, your gums and so on. So we have to think about how we can help with this. Now, I do recognise dentists are headline news today by coincidence, um, but I also wrote a blog about this one, uh, about dental health, um, just like two or three weeks ago, and I put it on my LinkedIn, and I've said we need to talk about teeth and students. Um, it is so important, but they are struggling, of course, to get um, access to the help and support they need. But also, half the problem is, for half of them, they don't recognise that it is an issue and why it matters. So that is something to maybe think about there. OK, sleep deprivation, one of my big topics that I talk about a lot. And I did um, a workshop just this week for PG students um, at a university. And of all the things I talked about in the workshop to do with looking after your mental health, sleep was the one that came up again and again. And the stats bear that out. Most, well, many students, about half of them, are basically having bad or fairly bad sleep and they're getting 
a lot of them, a large number of them, between five and seven hours a night because they're having to work and study and fit everything in, or they're stressed and anxious. Now, anyone up to about the age of uh, 25, mid 20s, is actually biologically needing about eight and a half, nine hours sleep. So you can see that they're not getting enough sleep and it impacts their mental health. It makes all of those things like anxiety worse. It's associated with more self-harm, unfortunately. It's associated with depression. And of course, it may be that if you have something like ADHD, you don't sleep so well as well. So really close interactions with sleep and mental health. And we know, for example, that our first year students have the worst sleep. So something to think about, and I'll come back in a minute to what we're gonna do, but it is really, really important that we think about this um, as part of their whole mental health approach. And finally, but <laughs> just as importantly, diet and food insecurity are really not great. Um, I'm understating it there, but we know that four in 10 students on average were classified as food insecure. Now that's so 44% actually. That's average in the north east, no, sorry, northwest of England, it's 60%. And this compares with on average adults in uh, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland of 18%. So we have students who have food insecurity at a level way, way above what the average adult needs to worry about. In terms of diet, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche. I've been a GP for many years. We know <laughs> that students don't have great diets, but actually it matters because it's not just, oh, well, for a couple of years, they won't eat great. And, you know, that's being a student. It, it matters much more than that. They are low on vitamin D. They are low on calcium, iron and folate. They are not having in the studies enough fruit and vegetables. If they're male students and actually male first years, again, really struggling um, with diet, they're eating much more meat, but also many more takeaways. One of the things I really liked when I was reading about uh, the latest evidence around diet and students were the suggestions from, it was actually a Canadian study. So Canadian students were saying what would help them. And they were saying, I mean, it's really simple stuff, I suppose, in a way, but cooking lessons, understanding about mindful eating and not eating for comfort. You know, some of so, so those are sort of educational things. And I think those are the sorts of things we can maybe help with. So moving on to the next slide before we go into all the what can we do about it. My idea here is that you create maybe a campaign, forget the whole sex, drugs and rock and roll, we need to be talking about teeth, vitamins, menstrual health, we need to be really bringing these topics to their attention and sleep of course it didn't fit in my poster in quite the right way but basically sleep as well we need to think about how we as universities can do stuff around health promotion and education i mean we're educational institutions because unfortunately you know we know the nhs isn't going to race to the rescue on some of this stuff and a lot of this is actually is health education certainly around you know diet and things like that okay so next slide speeding through and my final of my three topics you know is similar to Lily really it's so important it's compassionate communications um I picked that picture because it to me is one of the funniest goodbye you're leaving cakes I've ever seen <laughs> but words matter and it is so important that we think about how we communicate as a whole institution, of course, with our students, I mean, with each other, of course, but with our students. And luckily this has now reached a sort of national consciousness. Um, compassionate communications is one of the streams of the higher education mental health task force that the government has set up and that I'm part of. And um, it has taken this topic really seriously. And I'm delighted about that personally because, as one of my other strands of work, and I will just briefly mention suicide, is investigating, is probably too strong a word, reviewing student suicides and seeing, you know, what we could do perhaps differently, if anything. And one of the things that comes up, sadly, quite a lot is the communication of uh, disciplinary issues or academic challenges or failure of exams and so on with students was perhaps... Uh, potentially too formal, too legalistic, too intimidating. And so we do need to think about how we 
break bad news? How do we do that in a compassionate, thoughtful, kind way? As Lily said, bad news needs to be broken, but it's how we do it. And also when we do it. And that is really important too. Lily mentioned that uh, some universities are in fact now looking at not sending out any comms, not just difficult ones, any comms after 2 p.m. on a weekday so that any comms that are sent out, um, there is time that day for students to seek advice about it in the course of a working day. And the sort of thing that we see this kind of, you know, I, look, I looked up some of the examples in the sort of student chat rooms about universities communicating and there's you know the students are getting letters very legalistic letters saying that you've been withdrawn from the course and they've been removed from the university they can't reapply again that is a devastating blow potentially for a student and it is all about having much more sort of human interactions about how we manage that. Um, so really, really important, something that I personally feel very strongly about and think is something that we need to think about too. OK, and then moving on, because I'm well aware we've got to have time for questions. So what do we do? What can we do? Well, look, there are there are things out there that can help. Um, I've put a couple of pictures there that you may or may not be aware of um, support. So there's um, the charity Bloody Good Period is brilliant if you want to signpost your students um, and also if you want to kind of raise money and support them at all. Um, some uh, universities have dental schools um, and are able to provide um, Obviously, it's training for the dental students, but also free care for the student, other students. So it's all supervised. Um, so, of course, there are ways to look at how you can potentially get reduced cost or help towards dental care and checkups and so on. We need to think about how we help students to build their social school skills for long term human connections. We need to make sure that they are signposted towards the hardship support, um, free menstrual products, dental care, sleep um, support. There are fab fabulous resources now available for sleep support um, through the NHS, through their GPs, but also online at Sleep Station is a great website. The Sleep Charities, um, they're brilliant well worth being aware of and then of course <clears throat> as we mentioned reviewing how we communicate you know it's all about the delivery of that bad news and offering the support so that they don't feel alone and left with a very difficult situation okay and uh, I think that's it. I'll stop talking. I guess I'll just sum up by saying we need to educate our students around, um, you know, diet, sleep and teeth and health. We need to communicate in a kind and compassionate way and we need to help them build lifelong um, connections with other humans. If you want to communicate with me, I'm always happy to receive emails and um, do have a look at some of my free resources on my website. Thank you. Thank you, Don. That was brilliant. Uh, a lot covered there on the urgency of addressing the basic but crucial challenges students need assistance with, such as period poverty and sleep deprivation, you know, the importance of building human connections and friendships in a post-COVID climate. And of course, like Lily touched upon in their presentation, just being mindful of the language we use and timing for sensitive communications. So a real heartfelt thank you. And do check out uh, Don's other work, such as her blog, which she mentioned and will be circulated in the slides afterwards. Uh, so I'd now like to pass over to my colleague Katie for the Q&A portion. Yeah, just a really big thank you to the speakers again. That was, those were fantastic presentations. So everyone keep putting questions in the Q&A box, but we're going to get start, started straight away. We have a question from Laura. I find it challenging as a mental health professional to encourage compassion from academics when communicating with students. Any advice? Dom, should we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Look, one of the areas that as universities we need to perhaps work on, um, all of us, is communication between teams, so between staff. And the more we can meet up with our academic colleagues, accommodation colleagues, security and so on, the more we can share how important these sorts of um, challenges are and the difference that it makes. I am sure that if our academic colleagues understood the impact of poorly communicated difficult news, um, they would 
you know, get involved. I suspect a lot of it comes from we're all busy people. We haven't always got time to take on board you know, new ways of doing things. And I think some of it is just about sharing why it matters, because you know, fundamentally, I don't doubt that they would want to uh, to get involved with that. So I don't know what um, uh, sort of format there is at your particular institution for meeting with colleagues, but any way there is to do that or set it up, as Lily had mentioned as well, I think is one of the most positive things we can do. Better communication between teams is right up there on the top of my sort of list of things that universities need to be looking at. How about you, Lily? Yeah, I think um, I, I agree with everything that Dom said. I, I'd also say I've, I've read a well, it was a really interesting um, book, uh, which I would recommend to anyone who's in, in sort of communications for students or interested in that looking at it. it's called How to Write for Busy Readers. Um, and it's basically all about like effective communication. It's not so much on the compassionate side, but I think effective communication is compassionate inherently because you're not asking people to read more than they need to um, to get the information that they need. So I would recommend having a look at that. Um, and I think also that comes into how can we make things how can we make it as easy as possible for people to make the decisions we want them to make um, or click on the links we want them to click on in the email say? And I think for this, if um, if you're having difficulties with academic staff um, wanting to communicate in a certain way, removing as many barriers as possible for them to do that. So is it a case of getting together a sort of a bunch of emails which other universities are sending that you think are more compassionate and sort of tailoring that to your university and saying, look, here's the template, here is an example. All you need to do is sort of input information here, here and here. But we've written it all out for you because although there might be a uh, the barrier might be that the academic doesn't want to do the compassionate bit of it it might also be that they just don't want to change from what's the status quo for them so if you can help them along that journey by giving them those templates and those examples that might be um, a first step to getting them a uh, slightly closer to, to where you want them to be it's really great advice both of you thank you i hope hope that answers your question laura uh, the next question is from david is there any advice you can give to trustees slash governors um, are there any questions I should be asking the university or union? Lily, why don't we start with you? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, David. I think um, a lot of roles um, like sort of trustees and governors can often be sort of overlooked within these conversations, but actually you hold really important um, seats and in, in sort of power, uh, positions of power to actually ask questions, which can really start a lot of work. So I think if you're uh, sort of on the student union side I think speaking about things like moving to a welcome term um, often you, uh, student unions will be looking at, um, at freshers week so how can we move to a more sort of a spread out approach to welcoming students to universities David I happen to know that um, the institution that you're at is already doing that which is fantastic but making sure that that is continuing as well and then also I'd say from a, from a student union perspective and sort of on the flip side for university perspective, making sure that or asking the questions, are our teams in communication with the university's wellbeing teams? Are we linked up? Are we working together? Because there is no, well, not no point, but there is um, the effectiveness of our work is reduced if we're not working in line with what the university is doing and vice versa. The effectiveness of what the university is doing is not as worthwhile as if it's not in line with what the student unions are doing. And if we can work together, especially in terms of wellbeing, especially in terms of community building, then the work that we do be much more powerful. So I think often within, within student unions, there can be a sort of ownership um, of certain work and you're like this is what we're doing it's not the universities it's us but actually thinking about would it be more effective if we brought the university into this project that we're doing into these events that we're running and do them together is that going to be more beneficial for students so i think asking questions around how you're doing that collaboration um would be a good starting point that was really interesting thank you don how about you um, yeah, the roles in governance uh, are fascinating, actually. And I think um, you're probably in a good position to ask questions about how the university is addressing the causes of mental health challenges for students. So, you know, what are we doing to address um, food insecurity, um, financial hardship, and also around how are we educating students to value their own physical and mental health? So, 
often they're just not aware how much it matters that you eat well or exercise or sleep well. They think, well, I have to prioritize my, you know, my academic well-being or I don't have the money to do these things. or I've got to work um, three jobs to keep up with it. I understand all that. But, you know, as as a governance structure, you do have the ability to shape how the university can support students to both um, value their health, but also address some of those causes of, of hardship and um, mental health challenges. So I think I'm just going to jump in very quickly back on that because Dom, you sort of sparked some thoughts in my mind. I think another uh, sort of uh, a hard question which can be asked is if you're, if like universities or unions are doing work on mental health, is it the most effective use of that, that money being spent? So if you're talking about a big um, campaign to put things on social media, to run events, if that's not getting traction from students, would it be better to put that money into providing students with free menstrual care products, providing students with free food? And the same for the university. Instead of doing something big and flashy, which if it works and if you have the data to say that it works and it's attracting students, great. But if you don't, maybe would it be would it be better to spend that money on actually just providing basic provisions for students? It's difficult to make that move because it's almost like admitting right there is something really bad with what's going on for students. There is something really basic that we need to address. But I think asking those hard questions is something that you can do as a governor and saying, like, let's move away from something which looks really great and really cool and to just providing really what students basically need. Um, and, and those are the questions that, yeah, I think you can ask um, in those positions of power. Amazing. Thank you both so much for that. And Don, we've got a question directly for you here. Um, kind of referring to the gender-based statistic you've been referencing, do you think there's something to be said about young men responding less to these surveys surrounding mental health and well-being? Oh, interesting. Um, okay, so no, consistently, uh, studies have shown that young women uh, aged anywhere 16, 17 to 25 struggle more with their mental health. That was shown in the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, which was from a few years ago. I think that's been repeated now. So I think what we see is that young women tend to struggle more on a day to day with anxiety, self-harm, eating disorders, so on. That doesn't mean that young men aren't struggling. It just means that the numbers are different. Um, what we then see is a difference when we look at suicide statistics. Again, I'm just saying that I'm going to briefly talk about this topic um, because we obviously do know that three quarters of suicides are in males. Now, we can't say that that's for any one particular reason. It's complex. There may be an element of stigma. So they struggle and then they don't feel able to seek help. There may also be an element of um, spontaneity that comes from, um, so if we go back to brain development, the last bit of the brain to develop is the prefrontal cortex, and it is the bit that controls um, risk-taking behaviours and spontaneous um, behaviours, and therefore uh, because in males it develops slightly later than in females, it may be that our young males don't yet have the full capacity and ability to control an impulse to harm themselves. So impulsive behaviours are more likely to happen basically in males. So there are lots of complex reasons why it might be, as well as things like um, drugs and alcohol tending to be more involved um, for males. So, so it is complicated. And we know that when we look at the sorts of challenges that the genders struggle with, there are, you know, there are differences. Um, but we're also being much more aware of how many young males are struggling with eating issues and body issues, many more than we saw in the past, for example. And we are, you know, educating ourselves about that much more as, as professionals. So there are differences. Um, and I think it can just be helpful to be sort of alert to that. But obviously, with every individual person that we're dealing with, we just need to explore, as I'm sure you're, you will be doing, um, what the issues are for them. Thank you. That was a really great answer. Lily, is there anything you'd like to touch upon regarding gender and mental well-being? Um, I think... I think Dom really answered that question very well. It's not an area which I have quite as much um, expertise as Dom in terms of the sort of the statistics and of individual um, impacts of gender on mental health. But I think just just keeping the conversation open, making sure that any sort of communication that you're having isn't 
heavily focused um, on one gender or another or people that are non-binary you know I think it's just important to be open to the conversations and just checking really that anything that's going out any event any project is as inclusive as possible um, it's not not quite as a big a point as Dom but yeah I just think it's, it's an easy one we can all do just check the wording and make sure that what you're doing is actually open to everyone and whoever wants to join can yeah, really good points, both of you. Thank you so much. We have a, another question from an anonymous person. When students contact their universities for mental health support, should signposting to GP surgeries always be included as part of that response? Lily, should we start with you again? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. And I think a lot of universities will be sort of attached to, they'll have sort of their own um, GP surgeries or wellbeing surgeries, um, sort of, um, yeah, sorry, GP surgeries or doctors or on campus or that's like intrinsically linked to the university um so i think that's always you know a good place to start in including that information but i think it is really important to include other sources of support as well so whilst that might be the best place for a student to go there might also be other avenues um, in which a student can get support and for lots of reasons the student might have had a bad experience um, at a GP practice which obviously is not what we want to hear but it might be the case or for all sorts of other reasons they might just not want to use that avenue of support so whilst I think including that um, is helpful and maybe it's best practice um, there should be other avenues as well because I think just saying all oh, right if you're if you're not feeling good go to the doctors if that student actually doesn't want to do that then they might be turned off to actually finding any more support yeah and Dom of course you uh your work experience kind of aligns with this question very well <laughs> I'm completely biased uh <laughs> let's be let's be honest no uh I think that it is important to include GPs in a menu of options as Lily said for students if that is um you know obviously a, a relevant uh topic so whether it's physical, mental health, um, difficulty dealing with a bereavement, all sorts of things, you know, GPs and their teams are there to help um, with a whole variety of, of, of challenges. And, you know, um, the thing about a lot of these uh, GP practices now that uh, are involved with student health um, is that they have practitioners who work with them, you know, who are mental health nurses or uh, CPNs, uh, community psychiatric nurses, or um, sometimes pharmacists. There are lots of different people who work within that team who might be able to help. So, I mean, obviously it depends on the issue, but almost certainly there is some benefit to adding the GP practice to the list of options for a student if they're struggling with their, you know, physical or mental health. I think what I'd also just like to say there, um, sort of following on from, from Dom's point about it being a, a really great resource is, again, on something that I said earlier, making it as easy as possible for people to make those decisions. So it's great to put in sort of maybe the website link to the GP or uh, a phone number, but actually sort of almost writing a script for what a student should say on the phone. Okay, because if a student's never spoken to anyone about getting mental health support before, they might have no idea how to broach that conversation with a GP. Like, can I get an appointment? Do I need to have a call back? What is it that I need to do to get the help that I need? And that might be so overwhelming to a point where they actually just won't reach out for help because they can't um, understand how that conversation or how that process will actually work. So if you can just put a few steps in to say, if you call the G if you call your reception and you say that you're having mental health issues or you say we want to talk to someone about low mood anxiety most like likely is that they will then give you an appointment to happen in a week just laying out those steps might be the bridge between a student thinking i can't do this it's too much and thinking okay i kind of know what's going to happen so i'm going to make the jump and actually ask for help amazing thank you both so much we're going to try and squeeze one last question in really quickly if you could both give one tip that you'd give to university wellbeing teams to enhance their support for students what would it be little sound by lily do you want to go first um this is biased from me but i think talk to your student union find out what student reps know um find out what students would find helpful from students and from people who represent students amazing thank you and don I'm going to go with educate them to value their health um, and whether that's sleep or diet or cooking skills or booking an appointment with a dentist, <laughs> even, even though some of these things are challenging. I think educating people to understand for their lifelong health, how important it is to look after it now is really powerful. 
Amazing. Well, thank you both so much for that. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Again, a big thank you to both Dom and Lily for such amazing presentations and fantastic answers. It's been fantastic to hear from you. And we hope everyone who's attended the webinar has learned a few things, has a few takeaways, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. So everyone, I hope you have a lovely day and thank you again, Dom and Lily. Thank you. Bye, everybody. It's been great. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a nice day.